Thank you so much for inviting me, and I am um, very happy to uh, have a lovely day in Burlington. Uh, I don't know what your connections are, but you sure arranged a great one. So, um, there has been a growing and immense interest in social capital of recent times. So if we go over to the web of science, we can look at the growth in articles over time. Uh, in terms of starting out. Um, this is articles that actually use the title social capital. Um, in in TK Ons in my book on social capital, we go back to Tocqueville, Jane Jacobs, and many others who were talking about these concepts. They just didn't have the language. But now that the language is out there, there's been a huge growth. And the question is why? And I will argue that one of the key uh, reasons is the um, the link of social capital to collective action and for some of our questions today it's pretty hard to think about development of any kind without thinking about how you solve collective action problems so what is what's a collective action problem this is any goal that must require must require the input of more than a single individual uh, where uh, whatever is jointly produced uh, is shared, both the good parts and the bad parts, by others so that there is a collective good or mix of collective goods and bads generated and my contribution um, yeah, is important but I can gain benefits if I free ride on everyone else and we have um, uh, problems then of exclusion and um, uh, there are many, many problems. So inside a family, we have cl uh, collective action problems. Inside a housing unit, um, intentional community, we have collective action. We have them at a city. We have it in a county. We have it in a region of a state. We have it within a state. We have it across states. We have it at national. We have it at international. It is multi-scale in its efforts. And the problem of solving collective action requires people to gain some forms of collective action, some forms of social capital to solve it. Um, so uh, as I've indicated, it's difficult to achieve. Uh, getting the input from a variety of people is difficult. Um, uh, part of the problem is frequently that we can get some of it even if I free ride. So I see benefits achieved you know, without my input. Well, then I drop out, and then Bob drops out, and then others drop out, and slowly but surely, nothing benefit uh, is produced. So we have to solve the holdout problem in a variety of ways, and um, we have to build trust that others will uh, solve, will contribute in order to make us contribute, and because we contribute, others gain trust that others will contribute. So uh, one of our key questions is, you know, what is social capital? Um, one of the questions that frequently gets addressed, and we've already talked about it a little bit, is how is it similar or different from other forms of capital? Uh, and I'm going to exclude natural capital right now. Um, because it was natural capital um, in, in many forms exists without our self-conscious. Now, sometimes the way we use natural capital is a mixed form of capital. But let's learn, look at human-made capital. And how do we build all kinds of human-made capital? Uh, how do we measure the outcomes of human-made capital? These are, these are the sorts of questions that we need to be addressing. Well, I'll argue that all forms of capital are built as a result of time and effort, transactions, and transformation activities. We somehow invest to make situations that existed at time one, the structure of them slightly different at time two. So transformation, change in structure, transaction uh, are key in both, all forms. Um, and then sometimes capital is built not self-consciously but as a byproduct. So if you enjoy swimming and you uh, swim a lot 
uh, you are building human capital uh, in terms of better health, etc., it may not be self-conscious. You just enjoy swimming. Um, groups that enjoy meeting and working together may build social capital as a byproduct. Um, and uh, when people engage in uh, learning how to build one form of physical capital, there may be skills that they learn uh, from that building that physical, that transfer. Uh, so I will think of all of them as stocks. Um, so physical is a stock of natural resources, uh, material, pardon me, material resources. Human, a stock of acquired knowledge. I'm kind of trying to get acquired knowledge of how to use this system. <laughs> um, of individual knowledge and skills. Uh, they're both built by transformation activities and transactions. They both produce a flow of future resources, future benefits, and some of those benefits are positive. Almost all flows of resources may have negative externalities, and we should always be asking, are there negative externalities as well as positive? So social capital, the way I have defined it and many, others, many other colleagues, are shared understandings, norms, rules, and expectations. This is drawing very much on the concept that James Coleman used in 1988. Uh, so how, what are the shared understandings? Do we have shared norms? Are there shared rules that we use in this situation? Um, it is built by transformation and transaction activities. Uh, social capital, like all the other forms, produces some flow of future benefits and the potential uh, of some negative externalities as well as harm. All social capital, as well as other forms, create new opportunities. And if it's a structure, it creates constraint. So opportunities and constraints tend to go together. Now, one of the important things for us is to think about different forms of social capital. We're very used to the notion of a building being a different form of social capital than a road, than a tractor. Um, no, pardon me, different forms of material. We're used to that. We don't think a tractor is the same thing as a house. Somehow we've gotten the notion that social capital has all got to be the same thing. And no. As a form of capital, there are many forms of it. Um, and uh, teams inside a business firm or inside a research group, gangs, uh, cartels, uh, some of these are nice and some of them aren't so nice. Uh, the way we define institutions is as rules in use. What are the actions and outcomes that I must, must not, or may undertake? And when we use rules, we're using the deontics of must, must not, and may, drawing on uh, John R. Commons and a variety of others. And another form uh, is trustworthiness. So how are trustworthy relationships built over time? Um, so uh, as I indicated, rules and use are crucial uh, to building trust, uh, as well as forms themselves. So capital can be used to make capital. It can be used to make capital, it can be used to make capital, etc. So institutions as rules are a form of capital that help people or hinder them. So if the rules are um, not uh, congruent to building trust, the rules may hinder making f future investments in social capital. And I will go on to that in some, de some depth. Um, so, um, uh, one of the things that we need to realize is that social capital takes a long time to build up. It can be destroyed like that. One event in an intentional community that uh, sows distrust 
can in a, a week destroy the social capital that people have built over a very long period of time. And it's hard once it's destroyed, it's very hard to rebuild. So one of our ways of thinking about, I don't know if this is going to work, a little hard. Um, can you hear me if I'm out here? Okay, trust is really a very key part of social capital. And so our way of thinking about it is, it's hard to have trust if others aren't trustworthy. So trustworthiness is an attribute of a group that creates trust in the, in the sense of a single individual. Networks are ways that we build trust. This is the area that Putnam has done a great deal of work in terms of the role of networks and trust. And institutions, the way we're looking at it uh, as rules and use, uh, can build trust. And then we have to be thinking of what are the contextual variables that we're talking about. A groundwater basin is a different ecological system for people to manage than a forest. Um, a uh, urban housing in a, uh, a big city is an entirely different context than a small uh, community in a rural setting. And all of these affect collective action, uh, and that's part of our problem, how we solve development problems. So that's a very broad framework that TK Ahn and I uh, presented earlier. And then trying to begin to break into this, this is, we can break this down and break it down ever finer. But if we look at these forms of social capital, how do they affect a truster's belief um, in terms of a trustee's behavior? Uh, and when we have a social capital being built, uh, trustors uh, may entrust, and this is what many of us have studied in investment games in the lab, um, in terms of what affects people's willingness to trust others. And if the trustee reciprocates, we know that uh, we have better outcomes for participants. Um, but we always have to remember that there may be positive, neutral, or negative externalities and that we should not just think social capital is warm and fuzzy. It's an important source of capital but it may produce negative externalities and positive externalities or neutral for others. And that's an empirical question. We don't just say, ah, they have social capital, therefore it's good. Uh, we have to ask questions beyond uh, whether they have capital or not. Um, a firm producing weapons has physical capital, but it produces weapons. Uh, so it's, it's, we have to separate out those concepts. Okay, I will argue that the need to build social capital does not underlie a great deal of uh, contemporary development practices. Um, much of development practice is based on panaceas, and I could now spend an hour and a half on a diatribe against panaceas. I think one of the worst problems that uh, academia and development practitioners are facing is that people are constantly, ah, you know, we've got to centralize because they can't possibly do it themselves. Oh, no, 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 we've got to have market solutions because they always work. No, 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 we've got to have community control. That always works. No, 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 no. We've got to have a much richer sense of the multiplicity of ways of addressing problems and get away from thinking about panaceas. Therefore, a long time, a great deal of our effort in development, the USAID, CETA, that where we have studied a fair amount of Swedish CETA, have been building infrastructure. So the way to solve development is build roads and irrigation systems and all sorts of other physical. And um, a good deal of the engineering does not most engineering schools do not teach anything about social capital or property rights or anything of this sort. And so a great deal is you build the irrigation system and then, ah, it's going to work itself. And I'm going to present a little bit of data from a study that I've done with Nepali colleagues over a long period of time on uh, farmer managed versus agency managed irrigation systems in Nepal. And those of you who know Nepal well, will feel with me right now a moment of sadness. Nepal looks beautiful, 
uh, right now there's some very difficult problems going on in Nepal, but I'm not going to focus on those. Uh, I'm going to focus on the problems that farmers have faced for centuries, learning how to build irrigation and maintain them so that they can eat. Behind that beauty, uh, you just think about the problems of managing when you've got, got terrain that's like that. One person's paddy field, if it isn't maintained, can just collapse into the next, collapse and, and the whole system can go right down the hillside. So there, it's a big challenge to be able to maintain rice paddies and other agricultural systems in this environment. In this, uh, it's just showing one irrigation, two irrigation systems. Uh, this is a flat terrain here, but look in terms of the problems of going under a road and through a tunnel here. Uh, incredible. They, that looks very primitive. It runs incredibly well. So what, we've got to get our eyes to see the amount of work and maintenance activities that have been done to make these systems work. So we have been working with colleagues there. Um, we've been measuring three important outcomes. These aren't the only, but three. What's the overall physical condition of an irrigation system? Um, uh, does the water run through all the canals? Are there trees growing in the middle? Um, uh, uh, is it in good or excellent good or mediocre or terrible condition physically? Technical fit. Uh, technical efficiency is really the capacity to get water to the tail end. There's a certain amount of water at the head end. How much of it gets to the tail end so the tail end farmers have some water? Economic efficiency, basically studying the relationship of benefits to costs. And we now have data on 230 systems. Sorry for this small table, but uh, uh, it compares for that series of, of systems. Uh, farmer managed systems are systems that are built by the farmers, designed by the farmers, maintained by the farmers. Uh, agency managed are where the engineers have come in from the World Bank and Asian Development Bank and others and they come in with all the training and millions of dollars. Uh, and so it's, for some people said this is unfair. You shouldn't be comparing those primitive farmer managed systems with the World Bank and all the other fancy systems. But look, um, in terms of overall condition, um, the farmer managed systems uh, have a lot better performance than the agency managed systems. In terms of these are all uh, statistically significant relationships. In terms of efficiency, getting, while well, the farmer managed only t close to 30% get water effectively to the tail end, but my goodness, the agency managed only get 12 and a half. Um, uh, inefficient, only 8% of the farmers are inefficient to get water all the way to the tail end, and of uh, the agency managed these fancy engineering works, uh, 37 don't get much water to the tail end. If you look at economic efficiency, again, 33% uh, on the positive, highly efficient to 12. And on inefficient, only 3% were rated as inefficient versus 35. So these are very strong relationships. And I can go on in terms of human well-being and all sorts of other variables, but I'm just wanting you to see those um, for our, our work in Nepal. Now, people have said, okay, now tell me the, you know, give me the right formula for setting up a farmer managed systems. You know, you study this, there must be the proper way to do it. Well, we've studied the detailed rules and ways that people have organized and we find a huge variety. Now, we do find some uniformity. Those systems that work well across resources as well as across uh, irrigation systems do have agreements as to who's in and who's out of the group. Who's a member, who isn't. They may have, they may have gradation of memberships and gradation of responsibilities, but they have some agreement on 
who's in, who's out. The rules in farmer managed have been argued and discussed by the farmers. They use in the main consensus. They don't normally vote. Um, they don't get all the way to unanimity either, but they use high levels of agreement before they will make a change in their rules. Uh, and um, the agency managed, if they even have rules, uh, they're uniform. So they'll create a big system and say, well, uh, each, of the each of the subsystems should organize. Here's a badan. Here, you take this one, and it'll be uniform. Um, the Asian Development Bank helped out 85 systems in the Rapti Valley, gave them all the same rules, all identical. Uh, and they were dramatically different systems. And the farmers frequently don't know what uh, is going on. Uh, it turns out that most farmer managed use local circumstances. How many canals do we have, sub, uh, sub canals? Well, if we're going to have a governing board and we have three sub canals, we might need a governing board of a, 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 somebody elected or a chief or something and three represented. But if we have nine canals, we may need to have nine people. Uh, a, norm, an, a, a number that is culturally important in Nepal is five, panch. So panchayat, many Nepali institutions use five, but they vary. You know, if there's no particular reason uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the ecology, they'll use five culturally. That's accepted. But the variation is immense across systems. Um, so uh, what's also important is that the farmers themselves are heavily involved in planning, digging, maintaining, figuring out what's happening, what problems, how do we adjust, etc. So that the role of the users is dramatically different. Now, peop, uh, I'm going to go to the negative and then I will go to more positive. Um, the, um, uh, can we destroy social capital by what we do from the outside? And I think the uh, agency managed systems destroyed a lot because frequently they were built over where there had been farmer managed. They totally destroyed what the farmers had done, totally ignored the earlier, and just came in with this new system which five years later doesn't work very well. Um, uh, we've also done a lot of work on international aid, and we find the Samaritan's aid in practice repeatedly, So uh, the Samaritan's dilemma. Uh, we find in looking inside Swedish CETA or USAID or World Bank, there are common sets of incentives that we need to understand. There is a need for major expenditures rapidly. Because a year, you know, at the end of the budget year, if you don't have your budget spent and it goes back, it makes it look like what you're doing isn't needed, isn't essential. So we can apply it to someplace else. I don't mean how many times I've heard government officials discuss the problem that they face in getting the money spent um, because they don't want to lose it. Spend it or lose it. Um, and in order to spend it rapidly, infrastructure projects have a very substantial appeal because that's a way of getting a big chunk out the window right now. And we've got to understand that. I had a discussion in uh, Stockholm with uh, the then executive director said, oh, no, that's not our, we don't have that problem here. Well, I had just been discussing with one of the bureaus the um, problems that they were facing, and the head of that bureau had a champagne party for everyone on the staff if they spent their budget uh, two months ahead of the end of the fiscal year. And so, of course, they didn't have that problem, but uh, bureau chiefs were aware enough that the bureau, their individual bureaus, were competing for one another, and they had champagne if they figured out a way to get it committed so that they would be able, by the end of the year, to spend it all. Um, one of the incentives for many of the development agencies is to contract for very large expenditures uh, with national firms. So uh, US has uh, uh, 
supported a large number of our private corporations. Sweden does the same, even though I think CETA is one of the better ones in the country. And the officials, we did a very careful study in Swedish CETA of the career paths and the rotation. So people would be in one project six months, 18 months, 24 months. We found someone who had been four years. But if you're going to do a development project, it's seven to 10 or 11 years. So people are coming in at the very beginning or the middle or the end. They're not seeing the development process in a meaningful way, except the farmers have to because they're living with it. They've got to be at the beginning, in the middle, in the end, if it's going to uh, be something that they can carry off. Uh, I will argue that our own effort uh, to massively uh, destroy local governments in the U.S. and Western, U Western Europe has also been a way of destroying social capital. Um, the school districts in the United States, I have um, now we're about to one tenth of the number of school districts that we had uh, about 1910 or 15. Um, so we just went through and eliminated 90% of the school districts. We did similarly with local governments, except here in Vermont. You've got a pretty viable uh, system of local government in this, in this place, and very valuable. Uh -huh. the, um, when we do entire coasts, so we plan and we put an entire coast together in an ecological zone and we want to govern it by one set of rules, well, I come from California, and my state, the coastline of my state, is crossing multiple ecological zones. It doesn't make sense to have a single, a single microphone right in your way. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it doesn't make sense to have a single government unit that is the only decision. There's a difference between having facilities like courts and many other things at larger scale. We need large scale. But to have ecological zones of huge variation governed by one unit, uh, we need to be very careful. Um, so we need to understand places like the main fisheries. That's a very positive note. In 1920, the uh, main fish, lobster fishermen destro almost destroyed uh, the lobster fishery. It went way down, crashed. Um, and they, at the beginning, thought this was just nature and didn't take responsibility. But slowly but surely, they began to meet, began to puzzle what was going wrong, how do you build. They didn't call it social capital, but that's what they built. They slowly but surely tried to think through how do you protect uh, some ecologies? How do you protect bearing females? Uh, so they started developing rules about the size of a fish that you should collect. Well, that's fine for lobster fishery because if you collect it and you think you shouldn't have it and it comes in your trap, you pull it up, pull it back down and it doesn't die. You bring a bunch of fish up in a net, and you have a much harder time returning them to the ocean. Sometimes you can, but lobster you can throw back. They eventually got an ingenious idea because, you know, I throw back a bearing female, uh, and uh, then uh, somebody else comes along and picks it up. So my sacrifice to the common good is destroyed by someone else. Well, they got a signaling system, a marking system. It's called V-notch. And for lobsters, you can do this. You can take the tail and put a V-notch in it. And that is a signal to other fishermen that uh, this lobster, when I picked it up, had berries on the outside, meaning it was a berry fem uh, uh, a bearing female. Um, and please don't harvest this. Well, they started that locally in a few of the bays. They got that understood. But eventually, they had to go and get the, bar the people who bought to agree not to buy a V-notched female. That, uh, that took a long time of negotiation across markets. 
and eventually they got the state to back up. So these rules were developed locally. They were finally um, uh, authorized and approved by the state of Maine. And just a whole bunch of other things that uh, uh, Maine fishermen, and you have all sorts of things in terms of forestry institutions in Vermont that are quite creative. I don't know about um, fishery institutions in Vermont. But uh, the, the important thing is that self-organized, that uh, did different kinds of rules in this bay, from this one, from this one, that were ecologically and culturally developed, uh, slowly but surely solved a massive problem. And right now, the data is showing that the amount of small lobsters out there is very high, and uh, uh, they're doing rel relatively well. At least that's the best scientific information I've been able to get. OK. So um, we also destroy uh, if we say, oh, we've got to have common property for us. And I've watched that destruction where you go and um, you turn over forest resources to many, many, many forest groups by the following mechanism. You have a sign. You say, come to a meeting in two weeks. The district forester comes to the meeting. He says, all the people that are there, oh, you've signed up. This is great. You're the owners. And in two hours, he turns the forest over to them. And now, two hours later, they are the owners. Well, uh, the naive idea that you can go in and in two hours create an effective local group is just beyond my imagination, but it's been done repeatedly. So we, in the effort to supposedly create capital frequently, we've not done a very good job of it. Uh, OK, how can we enhance? I'm supposed to be talking about more positive. I wanted to bring negative just so we didn't think that this was easy to do and uh, natural. Well, partly, we need to understand that we need multiple forms of conflict adjudication through fair, rapid, and low-cost mechanisms. So if we say the only court system is available is the federal courts going all the way up to Supreme Court, that's a very expensive system. But systems that have evolved rules and norms for working with resources or housing or whatever, and also develop uh, things that meet regularly, that take any, you know, let's look at the little conflicts and figure out how to get them resolved now. Um, in uh, eastern Spain, there is a court that has met once a week for probably close to a century, no, a thousand, a millennium years, uh, a thousand years in Valencia. And uh, it's a very complex irrigation system. And uh, they meet on market day in front of the cathedral. Uh, and they take up any of the conflicts of the last week. So at the time that there's a conflict between owners, the water uh, guard master on the canal has final authority. And he says, you get the water today, and you don't. And then you guys can take that that next week to court. And that official also is taken before the court of, uh, it goes off the court and presents the case. And small written notes are made and decision made that week. Occasionally it's appealed. But that means there is a way of resolving the conflict at the time, because water's like gold in Valencia. Um, there's a way of getting it uh, articulated, and the pictures in the in medieval, uh, the oil paintings uh, in European art museums of this court have people standing around watching. I mean, as good as TV, because uh, you know this is the what the uh, you know the big landowner and the little landowner and things of this sort. I've had friends send me pictures in the last five years because I've been very uh, interested in whether this survives. It may not another 20 years because they're subdividing and it's becoming suburban, et cetera. But it has been an amazing set of self-organized irrigation and court. Um, we need more support of university, business, community networks. 
And I think you're doing a bunch of those things here, and that's very healthy. We've been trying to do that also, and it takes time and effort, but we're building uh, knowledge of what works one place, not that we tell them, because it works there, you do it. But how do we present information that people get knowledge and get new information? Um, we uh, In-service learning is pretty important, uh, student internships, all of that. And, we, and some of that's now coming back. But uh, our textbooks are not very well oriented to teaching people about social capital. We need to encourage joint scientific across disciplines. Um, the, um, uh, we need to be able to have multiple disciplines working together and to get that information back to the communities we study instead of just taking from them uh, and not returning anything. Uh, we need to be developing a better theory of collective action and I can be pretty encouraging on that score. I don't think we've solved it all but I think we're slowly but surely developing a better theory of collective action with some of our work in the field, in the experiment, in our formal theories. We need a more complex theory of human behavior to do that. If we presume that everyone is maximizing short-term material resources to self, and that's all, that's not adequate to explain how people solve collective action. If that's all humans do, uh, then we are back in the Hardin-esque world of the tragedy of the commons. On the other hand, we should not slip into thinking that everyone's a saint. Out there in the world, we have complex individuals who vary in their attitudes toward cooperation, trustworthy, etc. But the rules they use can increase the likelihood of being trustworthy and thus, uh, we, we don't have that in our theory, that in an environment of one kind versus another, people may learn how to be trustworthy and engage in trust. Uh, and we need, of course, as an institutional analyst, I will say, of course, we need to uh, know how institutions enhance or detract from intrinsic motivation, normative views. And we need a lot of empirical research, testing theory, which much of that is going on here, uh, in the experimental lab, um, in large-scale field studies, uh, in small-scale qualitative. We need a variety of methods, not just one. And we need to triangulate our results so that those who've done large-scale studies sit down with those who've done qualitative, try to figure out where they triangulate and fit and where they don't. And I will argue that challenging and building social capital is um, a fun, uh, economically worthwhile, and so there's a lot for all of us to do. So I will open it up for questions.